Welcome everyone. Hello? Yeah. Oh, I do have audio. Yeah, I do. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, good morning, and thank you for being here. Um, my name is Sarush Zaghi. I'm an ENT sleep surgeon. Uh, it's so great to be here with all of you, a lot of friends and colleagues in the room. Um, and I'm very happy to talk to you about the restrictive lingual frenulum uh, as a phenotype for sleep apnea. So. Uh, I have about uh, 80 to 90 slides to go over with you, so it'll take a little bit over an hour. I think the next one's about, the next lecture is at 10.30, so if you bear with me, about 10 or 15 minutes, we'll get through all this material and uh, to make sure that you guys understand everything. Uh, so my purpose of this lecture is to share with you the knowledge I've gained over the past uh, couple of years working in tongue tie, sleep apnea, and frenuloplasty. I'm gonna start by showing you the research. I'm gonna go over a, a new functional definition of ankyloglossia explain to you my technique and show you some of my results uh, by letting you hear from my patients, one of here is in the audience today. Um, uh, so here we go. So uh, first of all, I want to let you know that my lecture uh, for both, uh, I have this lecture at one, one o'clock and both of them, the slides are on my website. You just go to lecture files and you click and you'll get access to the, to the entire lecture file. You're welcome to take pictures or videos if, if you so desire. Uh, I'm very proud to be a part of the uh, Stanford Sleep Surgery Fellowship uh, Alumni Network. Uh, so we're a group of doctors who come from different backgrounds of, of, uh, of ENT, maxillofacial surgery, sleep medicine, and we've all done uh, the fellowship out of uh, uh, Stanford. Uh, and I'm very grateful to them for the, for the uh, opportunity to get ideas and get involved in research. And my, my role uh, in this group is, thank you so much. Uh, no, just, 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 this is fine. This is okay, it's okay. Yeah. And uh, my role in this is to, is to work on study design and statistical analysis. And with this group, this gives you a sense of the number of research projects we've done from 2015 to 2017 uh, together. Uh, as part of this, I was very lucky to work with Dr. Uh, Guillaumino. And this is my first introduction to the frenulum, just in 2015, where I was sent some data to analyze and to help with the statistics, uh, statistical analysis. So what Dr. Gimino did in this study, he's been a long ad time advocate of uh, the role of the frenulum in sleep apnea. They took 150 pediatric patients and they classified them into two groups, those with short frenulum and those with normal frenulum. And the way they defined the short frenulum is they used uh, Dr. Marcusson's um, uh, protocol uh, for inspection of the lingual frenulum. And what they also did is they looked at other physical exam findings including the tonsil size, malum potty tongue position, and high arch palate. And we're introducing this here, the how, to, how to examine someone, but we'll go into it more detail in our one o'clock lecture. But basically, uh, in, in ENT and sleep, these are the, really the only two things that, that are looked at when you're assessing a patient. And what we're doing with Dr. Gimino's study is trying to find what else can we look for. And one of those things that they're looking for is the presence of a high arch palate. So tonsil size is graded one through four, uh, malum potty tongue position, you should see all the way back to the throat, and that's a grade one. And if you're not able to, uh, it's a grade four. And so they just, they just studied these kids and looked at all different kinds of, of, of findings and divided into two groups, normal and short. And when I saw this data, it was astonishing to me because with 150 people to get these kind of p-values across the board is incredible. You don't, you don't get this with this, uh, this kind of a sample size. And so what we're seeing is that the normal group is different from the short group uh, in many different ways. So kids with a normal frenulum come to uh, see an ENT doctor, a sleep medicine doctor, with large tonsils. They come with, a, with an okay malum potty and without a high arch palate. And these are the kids that will get treated adequately at, at, you know, or, or, or semi uh, but most, at most ENTs, but, but if, if they still have apnea and they get 
and they don't get diagnosed, then they come to a subspecialty center like Stanford. And when you're there, this is all that you're seeing. You're getting inundated with these cases that aren't, that aren't being diagnosed properly. And we're seeing these kids, the tonsils are normal or small. The malum potty is affected, showing some kind of skeletal influence. And the palate is high arched. And in fact, these kids are even more severe than the kids uh, with, with tonsil problems. So I was sent this data set in 2015, and I was, I, was, I was astonished by these results. You just don't get these. And I, and I knew that we had something very important. And it's since that time that um, I really dedicated myself uh, as this to be my, uh, my research interest and my research focus. So a lot of the, the data that, you, that, that the, a, lot of, a lot of the knowledge about this area comes from expert opinion and case reports. And, and I understand and I see the literature that this has been around and known about it for 20 or 30 years. But to be honest with you, even though those are, those are, those are research, it doesn't make it on the level of research as necessary to, to get it onto ENT uh, meetings and journals and to become more mainstream. So what we're trying to do as a group is to take the level of evidence away from just case reports, uh -oh. yeah, uh, away from just case reports and expert opinion. And again, in my second lecture, I'll explain to you why this is inadequate. Um, and, uh, and, and trying to get it to higher levels of evidence. So this study by Guillaume you know, is, is level three evidence. So this is, this is still not perfect, but it's, but it's one of the best <laughs> levels of evidence that we have that specifically shows a relationship between high arch palate, tongue tie, and sleep apnea. And this is very promising because now we're in the area where we can actually have this discussion with other physicians and ENTs in the community. So how does the tongue uh, influence the face? And so, um, the, uh, the tongue should sit up against the palate and it, and it, and it should push the, and it helps with the development of the maxilla forward. Um, but oftentimes uh, there's, a, there's a frenulum, everyone has a frenulum, but there's two components of the frenulum. One is mucosal and one is submucosal. And that submucosal is what's oftentimes difficult to diagnose and difficult to treat. And what the submucosal frenulum is, is an attachment of the genioglossus muscle. So the genioglossus muscle should pull the back of the tongue down and in. But what happens all too frequently is that it attaches, it attaches anteriorly, and instead of pushing the tongue down and out, it pushes it down, and it restricts the tip of the tongue. And so we'll see what happens <coughs> and uh, the optimal way of, of treating this problem. <coughs> Why is it important to have good range of motion? It's, it's, it's important because your tongue needs to do exercise to maintain its tone. When, when the tongue is restricted, it's not able to exercise, and it loses tone. And so when it loses tone, the tongue falls back. And this is the base of tongue obstruction that you get in sleep apnea. Oftentimes, the tongue is so weak that even when they're standing up, the tongue will fall into their throat. And these people will come into my clinic with the forward head posture. So before I even see them, and I know a sleep apnea patient, I haven't even looked in their mouth. They're coming fo head forward posture here. And you'll see some examples of, of this. Uh, and also, it, it's, it's, been wide, it's been long time appreciated that a uh, tongue tie contributes to maxillary deficiency, but again, this is only based on expert opinion until maybe last month, uh, where, where Dr. Audrey Yoon um, uh, measured 302 uh, uh, patients. They measured their tongue tie, tongue tie uh, dental arch, and x-rays to actually show that if you have tongue tie, then you're at risk of having a high arch palate and, uh, and uh, and as well as soft palate elongation. So the question is, 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 is it a tongue tie? And so yes or no. And what we're working on is, is helping you guys understand that sometimes it's very obvious in this case. Yes or no, we hope that everyone will diagnose this as tongue tie. But all too often you're, you're stuck in this case. Is it tongue tie? And if, okay, you guys will say yes, okay, but, but a lot of people out there in the community, they'll say no, right? And so, and so how do you address this? Well, the first thing you have to understand is that yes or no is inadequate to describe this. And so we need a better grading scale. And this is, uh, what I like to use is, is, the, is the spiciness uh, category. So <laughs> what's spicy to me and what's spicy to other ENTs? So for me, a red chili is very spicy. So I'm gonna see it and say, this is spicy. But someone else might say, uh, you know, no, only a jalapeno pepper is spicy and a red chili pepper is not. And so the same analogy applies to, to tongue tie. Or we have someone like this, and she doesn't quite make the jalapeno pepper a spiciness, but to me, it's very spicy. And uh, something like this, I hope, would be considered U.S. grade pepper spray, and everyone will say this, 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 is, this is a problem. So what my colleague uh, Audrey Yoon did is, is, 
and I'm very lucky to work with her because my role is study design and statistical analysis. I depend on my colleagues to collect the data. And so over a three month period, only three month period, she measured 1,052 subjects. 1,052 subjects, and we did a comprehensive literature review looking at all different kinds of ways of measuring the lingual frenulum. And so Dr. Kotlow is in the room here, and I want to acknowledge him for his, for his work, and this is one of the, um, this, is the one of, this is the one of the most credited uh, forms of measuring the tongue that we found in the literature and that we used in our study. And you can see here uh, the, the, the grading scale that he has uh, developed. And we do note that this was validated in, in, in patients age 18 to 14 years so that, so that we don't uh, have a great understanding in adults. So you look at this case and you measure the way, the way it's performed is from the base of the tongue, the attachment of the frenulum to the tongue tip. And in this case, it would be called a mild ankyloglossia. And if you measured it in this case, you would see that the measurements uh, 31 and considered to be normal. But this is just a structural uh, uh, definition, and we're finding that this is oftentimes good, but, but maybe not enough. So what we did is we came up with a functional classification, and this is based on how you're able to use your tongue. This is not based on, on, the, on the frenulum, but rather the function. And two things go into the function. One is the frenulum, and the other is the tone. So it's possible to improve your function with exercises and, and sometimes with surgery. And so the way we define this, and I'll show you more, is, is when you open your mouth all the way, the tongue should reach, should reach to the back of the front two teeth about 80 to 100 percent. That's ideal. Average, you're going to see, is 50 to 80 percent. Uh, and below average, that, that's a symptomatic problem, is less than 50 percent. And in our studies, we've shown that if you're not able to reach your tongue more than 50 percent of the maximum opening, this is what's going to contribute to high arch palate and soft palate elongation. Uh, and, and these cases are extremely severe. These are the patients who are going to come with a forward head posture and upper air resistance syndrome, uh, antidepressants, and uh, poor quality of life. So uh, this is how you, this is, this is, we, we did the Kotlow measurements for these. And then we take the maximum interincisal mouth opening. And to get our tongue ratio of motion ratio, what we do is we take the tongue with incisive papilla over the maximum and we get a ratio. And then this number gives you an objective measure of defining the tongue function. So there's no yes or no. This patient is 76%. This can improve with exercise, and it can, and, and, uh, but at the same time, it's an objective measure that allows us to communicate uh, effectively. And then so we grade these into one, two, three, or four. And the way to take the measurement is not the incisive frame, which is the spot, but rather the incisive uh, papilla. You're going a little bit more than, than what you want it to uh, be for functioning. So when we take this girl uh, and we ask, is she yes or no, you can get different answers from different people. But everyone will agree that this is a girl with t grade two tongue range of motion. And so when we're communicating with this, we understand that those with grade three and four, those are the ones that we're, we're, we're more eager to go to surgery and do something about. And these are the cases where we take a step back and really decide, is there a functional problem? Is this something that we can improve with exercises alone? Or is this something that, that will require surgery to release a posterior tongue tie? And so going back to our analogy, we'll, we'll say grade one uh, is, is down here. Grade two is just under a jalapeno pepper. Anything above grade two is definitely a problem that should be, that should be addressed. Um, I've provided uh, this information. And, and so basically, we propose this use of a screening tool to communicate tongue mobility. This is not telling you what you should do. It's only to communicate and objectively follow our um, outcomes from surgery. And again, these, these, are, these are in the materials online if you wish to download them. So how do I do it? Uh, so you're going to see uh, everyone in this room is going to do the frenuloplasty in a different way. I'm going to share with you uh, my experience and, and my preferred technique and explain to you why that is. Just because I do it this way doesn't mean that everyone has to do it this way. Um, but I choose to do it in the operating room. I'm a surgeon. I feel more comfortable in that environment. I have great colleagues here who do it in the, in the clinic. And in many cases, if it's anterior, I will send them to the clinic to get it done, to get it done in that environment. Uh, so the patients that I, that I deal with are those who won't be able to tolerate it or that are, that are, so, that are so involved that they need, they need to have, um, uh, have it performed under anesthesia. So here's, here's a boy, five and a half, long history of tongue tie. It affects, affects his speech, his swallowing. He's a slow eater, taking it's about 30 minutes to complete a meal. He sucks on objects, frequent throat clearing, nasal drainage, and nasal congestion. I do these in the operating room. Um, I work with pediatric anesthesiologists and a great nursing staff that makes this a very pleasant experience for the kids. They don't remember anything. They don't feel anything. Uh, they wake, they, and they're eating, going home right after. This is the way I do it. 
um, we, under anesthesia, we put a mice batter, put one stitch in, in the tongue to gently retract, and we put the stitch here so I don't have to keep holding it with the graspers, cause a lot of trauma. The objective is to do this surgery with as minimal trauma as possible. And so in this case, you can see that his cotyl-free tongue length is about maybe one centimeter or so uh, to start with, and just a little bit of tension will, has already started to tear the frenulum anteriorly here. And then, so this is, this, is, this is the after picture, what it looks like afterwards. What I've done is I've gone from a one centimeter to a free four centimeter, maybe more, uh, free tongue length. I've excised it, and I'll show you guys in more detail in, in other slides, uh, the, the anterior uh, mucosal, as well as the submucosal attachment. Um, I did not use any cautery, and uh, we put, I put a few simple absorbable forochromic sutures uh, to promote primary intention wound healing, and I'll explain to you uh, why that is. Uh, and so here's, here's our post-operative measurement. It's about four centimeters of the free, the free tongue length. And so uh, when you're in the operating room, you can't use the function. You can't ask them to open their mouth, which is why I prefer to do these in adults awake, because you're actually able to uh, observe and interact with them to make sure that they got enough of a release. But when I'm not able to do that, I rely on the, on the free tongue measurement, and I try to go for as much as possible in this case, achieving four centimeters of free tongue length. And so this is him three days later. So the sutures have already fallen out, and, uh, but you're getting primary intention wound healing here. You're not getting that characteristic uh, diamond shape that requires you to massage the wound to keep it open. Here we are uh, seven days later, excellent tongue functioning with minimal scarring. Here's two weeks later. Uh, the mom says tongue movement is dramatically better. He doesn't chew on things like he used to before. Eight weeks later, and this, this, uh, he's doing really better, coughs less, sleeps better, swallows easier and chews up his food better. And then so, so the, when I do the surgery, my limit is, is the ducts here, and so the only scarring, the secondary intention is right here. Everything else is by primary intention healing. And so uh, initially the frenulum attached here, and eight weeks later, I'm sorry, initially the frenulum attached here, and now the frenulum attaches way down here, and he's doing great. He's able to reach his tongue all the way out and even into the back, in, into the back. He really enjoys it, he's very proud of this. Uh, and uh, he's, ve he's actually very happy. It affected all areas of his quality of life and very rewarding. One thing, I, you're not doing primary intention. What you're doing is you're taking the tongue and you're getting the two areas primary. But if you were really getting primary, the tongue would be attached to the floor of the mouth. So you're really getting secondary healing intent rather than primary. Because if it was pure primary, the two areas you cut would be right. together. So you're getting primary healing of under the tongue and under the floor of the mouth. So, so, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll bring a slide with primary intention. So what you're suggesting is that if it was primary, this would reattach there. So, so I will show you a slide uh, and, and share with you my understanding of what primary intention is. Maybe, maybe we're not defining it in the same way. If you have a cut on your finger, you put a band-aid on it, that's primary intention. If you keep them separate, use your separate to be secondary. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll share with you a slide in just a little bit, yeah. So here, 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 here's the day of surgery and here's eight weeks later. And uh, this is the tongue range of motion. And so what's useful about this grading scale is that we're able to quantify so that we can say he started as a grade four and that now he's a grade one. And so here's a little girl that I did, uh, very similar. Uh, this is, I, I, use, uh, I use sutures for uh, what I consider primary intention for both the lip and the tongue to minimize the scarring. And this is her one week out with, with, minimal, uh, with minimal scarring there. Uh, so wound healing, so primary intention versus secondary intention. And so this is the way my understanding is that when you put a suture in, you're approximating the two edges to minimize the hairline scar. When you're using secondary intention, what you're relying on is the wound to fill in with blood, to develop granulation tissue, and then to, to, to contract in. So this is my understanding of primary and secondary intention from, from, from my experience, but I, but I recognize that we may have different definitions and explanations. Right. Uh, so th in this case, it's going to scar in together, um, and, and we, we, we can discuss it. But what I mean by, uh, I think we have different definitions of this. Yeah. So, what, what, uh, so just because the two edges don't come together, you can close it in diamond shape, and that's called V to Y closure, primary intention. So, so it's, it's maybe, maybe a little different, but this is, these are techniques that are used in, in like, for example, facial plastic surgery and, and other areas like that is, what, is where I'm, uh, I'm getting this, this, this uh, my understanding from. So, so uh, 
if you're going to have goals, uh, you want to optimize the outcomes after frenul frenulum release. And there's different ways of achieving it, but in my, uh, we would, I would say primary intention and the way I'm defining it is to bring the two edges where you want them to heal uh, together. Uh, I, ch I prefer to minimize scarring due to cautery or laser. And there's nothing wrong with using it, but you have to be aware that when you use that, you're going to have uh, collateral injury uh, to, to increase the, the length, uh, the, uh, the ablative tissue surface, and the very important role of myofunctional therapy. The second goal of, of frenuloplasty is to do a complete release. You don't want to do an incomplete release. You want to get both the mucosal and the submucosal uh, deep uh, posterior attachments. So why do I do it? That's I should I explained to you in kids I do this procedures to help promote um, a tongue functioning, speech, swallow, and maxillofacial development. And now I'll show you why I do this procedure in adults. Hi, my name is Katerina Woodish, and my father's really tongue-tied, can't use his tongue at all, and I had a phrenectomy when I was seven because I was tongue-tied, and it didn't make much difference. My tongue looked sort of normal, but I've had really bad headaches my whole life. I have scoliosis, um, a lot of jaw tension, a lot of problems sleeping, and um, I had been told that perhaps I should go see uh, an oral myofascial specialist, but I hadn't done that. I actually did a, uh, had to do a palate expansion because I had such bad sinus infections all the time and I didn't want to do sinus surgery. And the palate expansion helped, and it helped the headaches somewhat, but not entirely. It got rid of the sinus infections, but I still have a very small palate. Um, and eventually after that, I decided I would go see Joy and I would, Joy Moeller, and I would go have um, an evaluation and she suggested right away when she saw how I was swallowing that many of my issues, including the not sleeping, including the constant headaches and the TMJ, might really change if I had a deeper phrenectomy, that my, that my um, adhesions, I don't know what you call them, were, were deeper in and were submucosal and that they had not been uh, disconnected in the first surgery. So I came to see Dr. Zaghi and he agreed that this would make a big difference. And I had a tremendously forward neck when I came to see him. I was sort of like this all the time and lots and lots of tension all the time in the jaw, the back of the head, constant headaches. And um, the experience of the surgery was really amazing for me because I was scared of it because I had this botched one when I was seven. Um, and Dr. Zaghi and uh, his assistant were incredibly um, present and, and, and kind and, and informative so that it wasn't so scary to do. The actual procedure was not painful or difficult really at all. But what amazed me during it was we I had pretty deep the need to go pretty deep to cut the cords. So what was amazing to me was that the first layer of cords, I didn't feel much, and I thought, oh, I'm going to be the one person this doesn't really change. And then the second layer, I started to feel this opening in the back of, in the back of my neck, in particular where the neck connects to the spine. And But the third layer, when, when he clipped them, it was like everything in my head and, and, and back opened up. And so now you can see that the way that I hold myself is completely different. This would have been impossible before the surgery. So in one second, there was this feeling of, oh, everything opened up, the pressure in my jaw is gone, the pressure in the back of my head is gone, um, all kinds of possibilities are opening up. I've had a little bit of a dance with my scoliosis because once things started to revise themselves, my dowager's hump, which I had a really big one gone in one second flat, but now the rest of my spine has to adjust to that. So I've had a couple of weeks where things keep coming and going and they're not necessarily so comfortable. However, I seem to be coming to the end of that already, so it's only been a month since my surgery. And mostly just what I feel is this tremendous expansion and uh, a lightness in my head, neck, and jaw that I couldn't have imagined before. I, I, when it happened, I thought, oh, this is what normal people feel like. This is how easy it can be to be in the world. And the fascinating thing, because I work with people's emotions, I'm a somatic therapist, is to notice in myself how from the second that those last cords were clipped, there's a sense of ease in the world for me that wasn't there before. I'm not taking anything quite as seriously I just have a fluidity and a sense of balance that I didn't have when I was always like this. So now there's so much possibility opening up. So I am really, I'm so grateful I've had this surgery. I wish I'd had this deeper one when I was seven and <laughs> didn't have to have this long process. So I would, to any parent who has a child 
if your child is struggling with headaches or sleep problems and you know that there's some degree of tongue tiedness there, if you could gift a child with what has just happened for me at the age of almost 60, if you could give it to a young one, it'd be pretty amazing to not spend your life struggling with this tension. And those of us who have spent our life struggling with this tension, to us it's normal. We don't even know there's another possibility, but to find this other possibility now is really, I don't have words for it, I'm so grateful for it. And if you have a child who might have this issue, it, the, the surgery is minimal in, in comparison to the gift you could give them. So I would strongly suggest it. Okay, and, and thank you to Joy for, yeah. And, uh, and all, all the videos that you'll see of my patients come from Joy Moeller, so I, I really acknowledge her for her, her vision in this field. So let me show you, so this is a, a baseline, this is one month uh, post-operatively, and I do use the sutures, uh, and I suture it this way to prevent the, the reattachment. Um, uh, so we went from a grade two mobility to a grade one mobility, and with the, with the functional classification, this is someone that you wouldn't necessarily had a tongue tie, but we're now able to better uh, define her outcomes. Uh, so this is what she was like before. Uh, what I do is first I do a phrenotomy, so I cut, I, I cut to expose it, and then underneath you're seeing this, uh, this genioglossus muscle attachment, it's attaching way anteriorly, and it's contributing to, to asymmetries in the protrusion of the tongue. And so release it, and I do some dissection, and we'll show you more detail, and then I put sutures to, to close what I consider this to be primary intention and this to be secondary intention, edge to edge skin, and then uh, the granulation tissue, uh, filling in this area to scar it in. So, so we went from grade two to grade one mobility, and of course an important com component is the uh, post-operative care on which I depend on my, uh, my functional therapy colleagues. Uh, and again, so grade two mobility to uh, grade one mobility. And so she talks about some emotional changes. It's on, it's on, it's on YouTube if you, if you decide to go uh, look it up, uh, but I'm gonna skip ahead just so I can share um, more things with you. Uh, so then this is her posture changes, baseline to immediately post-operative. And uh, you know, we'll, we'll re release this muscle and it's gonna change uh, her entire throat. She's gonna, she may feel it um, as the hyoid pulls up, the tongue base pulls down. She can finally um, uh, get her tongue out of the throat and, and to breathe more easily. So here's another example of what we do. Can you pitch? Try to pitch? Okay. And let me count to ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Good. Ten. Excellent. Relax. Relax. We're intra-op here in a, in a uh, frenuloplasty, and uh, he had a very posterior uh, tongue tie attachment. He said something very interesting to us. Go ahead. Uh, one of the things I noticed was uh, my breathing was, I didn't even realize that I, I was struggling to breathe. I, I, it was just a, such a transition of feeling the breath going through my body compared to how it was before. It was very obviously noticeable. It's extremely relaxed. Like, I almost just want to take a nap. Uh, tension has released my face, my head, and I feel really, really good. <laughs> okay, awesome, yeah. awesome. Thanks for sharing that. We have to yeah. capture that uh, right here in the middle of our procedure. Thank you. <laughs> we just finished the lingual frenuloplasty, and uh, it's been about 15 minutes or so, and he has some comments to share with us. I've, uh, I've noticed that, uh, uh, that basically what I'm trying to say is it's almost as if uh, like my muscles are like trying to go back to that tightness of where it used to be before the tongue cut, but it's like it can't. It, like, it, like I have seconds of like, you know, it's trying to be tight, but then it just, it goes, it stops being tight because it's almost like it can't be tight anymore. Yeah. It's like something I've noticed in my, like my face specifically. Amazing, it's amazing feedback to, to And then my shoulders and my neck when I stood up felt phenomenal, by the way. Definitely, there's a difference. We'll love to hear it. Thanks for sharing your feedback yes. so others can learn about uh, your experience. Okay. Uh, so, so uh, you know, this, this still amazes me when I do this, uh, and so I had to capture that and share that with you. I always do this procedure with a Maya functional therapist that was trained under, under Joy, and uh, it's because of my work uh, with her that I was able to achieve these results, because the purpose of the, of the surgery is not just to release, release the tissue. It's, it's to get their tongue free. And so what I do is I do an incision, we do some exercises, 
we do some assessments, and we keep going until we release all the uh, all the attachments so that they that they can regain the function that they that they deserve. So here's how I do it in adults, and then uh, we'll go step by step, and then I'll show you a, a video. Uh, so so uh, we have them. So in order to qualify to have the surgery, they have to be able to stick their tongue up to the front two teeth and hold it there without shaking for 30 seconds. If they're sticking up their tongue and it's and it's quivering, they need more exercises. I say go do more exercises. Come back in two or three weeks. Um, I also, if I, that's if I'm going to do anterior. If I'm going to do posterior, they have to show me the cave. They have to be able to sustain this for at least 10 seconds. If, they do, if they're not able to perform this, then I just do an anterior release. They can go back, do more exercises, and then they can come back for the posterior release. The posterior release being the attachment to the genioglossus muscle. In this case, he qualified to have both. Uh, so again, so we start, I have them stick their tongue up to the front two teeth and I inject with local anesthesia. 1% lidocaine with a little bit of ep epinephrine. Just about maybe like half a cc is all that I find that I need. Uh, I start with a phrenotomy. This is a simple incision. I do it uh, about, about five millimeters above the sublingual ducts here, uh, just to expose. The next step is uh, we do assessments. And so we say stick out your tongue, do the cave. And so now we're seeing the genioglossus muscle going up this way. The genioglossus muscle should go backwards. It really shouldn't attach to the tongue tip here. Uh, so then, uh, so just, uh, this is him in the, in, the, in the straight position. What I did here is we're doing a phrenectomy. So I'm peeling off this tissue to reveal the uh, submucosal frenulum underneath. Oops, let's go forward. And so as, as we're doing this, we're seeing that he has asymmetric tongue protrusion here. So that suggests that there's a band here that we need to release in order to get him to be more symmetric. We also see in the way his teeth, his teeth develop, this asymmetric tongue, uh, tongue protrusion. Uh, okay, and so uh, we continue uh, with our with our uh, phrenotomy, and I take and I take it all the way um, uh, anteriorly uh, to the to the tip, sometimes even uh, to get it to its normal natural uh, function uh, that we want it to be. Um, this is what it looks like. We address the posterior, and so uh, I go in here and I use uh, just the Q-tip to divulge uh, the attachment muscles, and still we're seeing that it's a little bit asymmetric. So I work with my therapist to do exercises to, to really observe for the tight bands. And it's just a few cuts. I'm not cutting the whole muscle. I'm just getting into the fascia. Just enough, the small cut, uh, to release the muscle down. And so again, we're seeing uh, asymmetries here in the way he's able to protrude his tongue and to do the cave. But we're noticing that this is, might be due to either structural or functional. In this case, he has a weakness on this side uh, that may be accounting for it. And so this is him after the procedure with all the release, uh, more, more, more symmetric tongue protrusion. Um, but then when we reassess, he goes back to this asymmetry. And so we're determining in this case that this is due not to a structural, but to a functional problem that will improve with therapy. And again, so here's also the asymmetries. And so then I put stitches in uh, to promote the, the, uh, the minimal scarring wound healing. And again, he still has the, the, the functional uh, deficit here. Uh, that will improve with time. Okay, and then so I had him come in uh, three days later on a co course just like this uh, to talk about his experience. So he had, this is, is that this is him in the pictures? He had it done three days ago. Sleep study done in 2011, actually, too, uh, and they hadn't found um, any apnea. Uh, and they diagnosed me with paradoxical insomnia in the late sleep phase. Uh, and I you know, pursued a lot of interventions with respect to sleep hygiene and other stuff, um, and then happenstantially found a dentist who referred me to Joy. Uh, and we started working together, and I, I noticed improvements in my sleep. Um, I had an ALF, ALF device, uh, and then when she mentioned Dr. Zaghi, and I heard that he'd uh, come out of sleep med at Stanford, I thought, okay, this is a, you know, very interesting nexus. Um, and the surgery was kind of wild, because it's very different than a traditional surgery you are participating. Uh, and at certain points, you were like, you're wincing, are you in pain? I'm like, no, this is just really weird. It's like, and I think at one point I said, 
very, very much prior, I said, or right before, I said, should we do a metabolic panel to show efficacy? And you're like, no, it's going to be how you feel. And I'm like, yeah, right, okay. <laughs> but then as you, um, you know, make the incisions, which is kind of this like uncanny experience because the tongue's locally anesthetized and you're you're cutting and you know I obviously did not really want to see the scalpel in my mouth but um, then this wave of, of tension releases out of my body and you really do need the breaks uh, I felt all the muscles in my face relax my shoulders relax suddenly I had to adjust in the chair because I you know kind of felt that much taller um, and then afterwards uh, you know you alternated Tylenol and ibuprofen, which I almost didn't um, necessarily need from a you know any kind of acute pain management standpoint, but more just the the gestalt experience of rearranging the body and suddenly having this new tongue mobility. Uh, but I would also say I really do feel that um, like serenity or just the much calmer muscles and uh, just a presence and by really vitality that I've never felt before. So thank you. Okay, so this is him uh, 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 five days later, uh, w wound healing great. This is him three weeks later. And so I talked about wound healing. So uh, it's, it's during the, uh, so the first hour to days, you're gonna get vasoconstriction, coagulation. It's after uh, a day or so that you start to get this fibroplasia and granulation tissue formation. And this is where the scarring happens. It's really, you know, starts at a, uh, about one day and it goes up to about three weeks. And it's this period of, of contraction that uh, is most important in the wound healing, especially from about, you know, a couple days to three weeks out. Um, the granulation tissue there it develops and it pulls in. And then after that, uh, you're going to get maturation or modeling so that the wound relaxes. And so how do we use this to our advantage? Um, one is I, wanna, I like to minimize the amount of scar tissue that's there to minimize the amount of contraction. And, and the second is to really depend on the, the exercises afterwards to, uh, to strengthen the tongue and to prevent the scarring. Uh, so even, even with other wounds in the body, if you have early scar formation, what you encourage them to do is massage the wound. So you can see three weeks starting to contract, but by four weeks he's already starting to release again. So it's really during this two, three uh, week period that you want to work with them intensively uh, to prevent that scarring um, as best possible. Let's see what's this. And this is a patient who's here in the room actually. And this is how I do it. So this is a phrenotomy incision. That's the phrenotomy. This time we're doing a phrenectomy. I usually, I usually spend about 45 minutes doing this procedure real slowly, but this is, this You're is numb, right? gonna look like I did it in a minute. Removing the prior scar tissue. Okay, rest. We let patients rest for five or ten minutes between the incisions. There you are. Okay. Hold it. I'm just cutting very small attachment fibers that my myofunctional therapist has identified for me uh, as so to be the restriction points. Down here, right? But sometimes the fibers attach way up here. They're be coming off. Let's see. So you're just doing some divulgence. I don't think there's any more. Let me do a couple more exercises. There's, there's maybe one fiber here. Yeah, let's do a lot of more. Is it asymmetric? More. Yes. So like this mm -hmm. fiber here. So that's deep. Huh? Very important. Just hold it for me. And then I suture it close. And we have, we have a longer video that we'll make available online. Uh, so I just I just hold it I just hold the cotton ball. So let me pause it. You do metabolize quickly. Mm -hmm. Just cut, 
put a cotton there to hold it. The blood, the blood, the blood will seal. Even if they have a coagulopathy, it just takes time for the blood to seal. Okay, so you right. just put a cotton ball. You hold your finger the there. Muscles changing. All it will stop. There, huh? mm -hmm. As it's long really as you avoid there, the, right? the lingual vessels, even in that case, just a little bit of pressure will make the wound bleeding stop. You don't need to. You don't need to be eager and cauterize. Your neck feels different too. Mm-hmm. I feel like my head is a little tangy this way. Fantastic. Wow. Yeah, <laughs> that's what yeah, you get. Hey, this is George. Uh, I just had a tongue tie release from Dr. Zagi. Uh, it's been George? great after procedure. <laughs> like, I took a painkiller right after it. Um, but after just when I sleep, I'm feeling great. You know, like just just a little bit of pain, a little bit of numbness, but life feels normal. Like I can speak without much problems. I can eat whatever I want. And uh, uh, the tongue just feels great, you know. Uh, I actually had one tongue tie release before this, and but it's not, it didn't go that well. Uh, the tongue is still restricted. I still cannot move the tongue all the way up to my upper roof. And now I can do it without any problems. And uh, it has been helping with everything, you know. Uh, body postures, so like I've had a headache before, and I mean, it's uh, much better now after a time release. And uh, we are going to do um, extra surgery after this, and the tongue posture is really going to help help me to get a stable result after the surgery. So, yeah, I have good hope for what's going to happen. Okay, and then I'll have George stand up to just th thank you for that, uh, for, for allowing it. You want to say a couple words? So, he's, yeah, so, so now he's, he's working in the myofunctional sciences himself because of the, so the changes he's seen. Uh, so all the patients I showed you are patients of Joy's um, uh, uh, and uh, can't emphasize the importance enough of the myofunctional therapy. Um, there are protocols uh, that, that Joy has for the post but uh, really I know that everyone has different perspectives on the post care, and so that, that, that's okay too. And th these are available uh, online. Uh, so I thank you, and, I'm, and I actually have some time for questions if, if there's anything. <laughs> Any questions? Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I like to use uh, just like small uh, Metz bomb scissors. I like to have one uh, baby Metz that are straight and one that's curved. And the straight ones I use for the phrenotomy and the uh, small genoglossus attachments and the curved one I use uh, for the phrenectomy, uh, picking up the tissue and, and cutting it. Yeah, so I, I don't have much experience using laser, um, and uh, I, I know that that's, that that's a technique that, that a lot of you use, and I would suggest for you to use a technique that you're more comfortable with. Um, I prefer, yeah, go ahead. The reason I'm asking is that you mentioned that one of the rationales for your use of um, scissors is that you mentioned that a lot of people have the association between that and laser use and scar tissue. Yeah, so, so, if it, if, yeah, so if it's done in, right, so this is, in expert hands, you're right. So, so if, you, if you're an experienced practitioner using a laser, you, you can use it just like a scalpel. Um, um, uh, at the same time, uh, this, is, this is my preferred technique, and I've seen a lot of ENTs use cautery uh, for this, and when you use the cautery, you just, just kind of cut through to prevent the bleeding. You're a little bit over-aggressive and can predispose to, to scar tissue. But if you're using the, the laser judiciously, and you're only using it you know, um, to get through the attachments, uh, then you know, uh, we, we, we'd love to learn and about the different ways of doing it. In your, in your measurements with that Dr. Yoon that you used, do you guys do a maze with the tongue uh, suction, like doing that case, and have you seen that it's 25 millimeters or less in people that really are restricted <coughs> posteriorly and submucosal and gastric in my experience? So so, so, so you're saying measure the cave and then and then and then explain your technique again? So, so if, you, if we do the main normally, we're on the, the papilla, uh -huh. and then when we measure here, we're very restricted. Okay. Okay. So. 
that's a great that's a great tool, and we should we should we should do studies on that. It's a great that's a great suggestion, and this is where uh, new new things come up with. So this that's fantastic, and and we should measure it. And I'll give you my card so we can we can do those studies together. Anything else? All right. Okay. Well, thank you very much, everyone. I really appreciate your attention. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay. Okay. Very good. I'm a PT. Okay. Great. I've written a book on head yeah, and jaw sure. stuff, and I've been trying to come up with a just okay. a, a screening thing great. that has the section and different for things that include some hypermobility. Fantastic. My email's on there. Read about this. Thank you so much for sharing this. You have so much yeah. more to learn and work together. Yeah. So thank you for your work. Yeah, I, I got a belly, so. I was like, uh. Hey, I'm going to try and get this one up here now. We, we charge it. This is somebody's. Yeah, this is probably for this. This is probably for this. Can we open it and go ahead? Uh, okay. You want to be on the screen? Yeah, yeah. I don't want to be on the screen. Oh, you're still. You don't want to? No. So just take this out. Yeah. 